This is the uh, Kinsella on Liberty podcast. I think it's going to be episode 207. Um, usually on the podcast lately, I've just been putting up interviews that I do on other people's podcasts. Haven't done many original or, or some of my speeches at conferences. On occasion, I'll do an original thing. Um, it's actually Sunday, February 21st, early in the morning. About to go to bed. Something I've been thinking about doing. Um, I'm a little bit tired, of course, of talking about intellectual property all the time, but it is a very uh, important issue, and um, there's something I want to clarify, um, a few things I want to clarify. There's terminology, there's confusion. So many people have opinions about intellectual property or IP, and they talk about it all the time without really understanding it. Um, I pointed this out in other talks before. It's routinely uh, misunderstood. The different types of IP are often, almost always, confused by non-specialists. Um, patent, copyright, trademark, sometimes trade secret will be used interchangeably. Someone want to talk about, uh, I don't know, copywriting an invention or patenting a novel or something like that. So they don't really even understand the systems, which I understand. Uh, the only time it really bugs me is when there's someone who is a proponent or an advocate of IP who doesn't even understand the legal system that they're in favor of. Uh, seems to me uh, irresponsible. But um, So just as a brief overview, um, well, first of all, let me say something. I think that a lot of the my fellow opponents of IP often object to the term intellectual property. I'm not really a big... Uh, I don't really worry too much about terminology. Uh, it is called that in the law, so to communicate with people, we need to use some terms. I don't think that validates the underlying arguments for it just by calling it intellectual property. Um, but I do think it's good to point out that um, <clears throat> it's uh, uh, the term intellectual property was come up with as a sort of propaganda term by its opponents, by its proponents to argue in favor of it and to overcome arguments against it. Um, the one reason I'm not too bothered by the term is that I try to use the term property in a more careful way to refer to the r relationship, the ownership relationship between a human being and a given scarce resource. Um, most people think of the thing owned as a piece of property, and I think that can be misleading. So to them, they'll say something like, no, these are people that I agree with, usually, on being opposed to IP, or IP law, I should say, IP rights. Um, they'll say, um, is, our idea is property. And I don't really think that's the argument against IP law, that ideas are not property. Uh, it's that ideas are not scarce resources that are not ownable things. Okay, that's the better, more precise way to put it. So the other confusion is, uh, and I'm going to get to the heart of my comments here. I was about to go to sleep, and I, I was just thinking about it. I didn't want to wait till tomorrow. and just thought I would do this before I go to bed. Um, the heart of my talk is I'm just going to try to uh, explain why intellectual property is not about theft, it's not about contract, it's not about fraud, and it's not about plagiarism. And I'll explain why um, I want to emphasize that in a second. But let, let me just briefly explain what the four types, the four classical types of intellectual property rights or law are. Uh, Primarily, the two biggest ones that we, we, we really have to worry about are patent and copyright. And patents are basically legal monopolies granted by the state that last roughly 17 years that cover inventions, practical, useful processes or machines. Um, copyrights last usually over a century, the life of the author plus 50 or 70 years depending on the country. So almost a century or sometimes more than a century um, for original works of authorship like novels or paintings or even software, things like that, movies. Uh, so that's creative works. And then trademarks identify the source of goods. 
know, like the Nike symbol, Coca-Cola symbol, the McDonald's mark. Um, so trademarks um, identify that. And then trade secrets is just a realm of law that protects um, – um, it, it allows you to use court force to keep a secret from getting out if it's about to get out. If it becomes public, it's too late. So it's not just the practical ability to keep things secret, which you don't need a special realm of law for. You just keep things secret. It's a way to keep the secret from getting out if it's about to be leaked by a former employee or something like that. Um, I think all four types are totally illegitimate laws for various reasons. The worst offenders being patent and copyright. They do the worst, the most damage. And then one more point of clarification. Um, um, People use the term intellectual property uh, in various ways, sometimes ambiguously. So sometimes a businessman or an engineer or technologist will use the term intellectual property to refer to the technology of the company or the secret, the know-how of the company. So they'll refer to their designs as their intellectual property. Um which is not exactly precise. I think they do that because such designs are often subject to intellectual property rights, not always, but they just use it broadly in that sense. So they'll say their intellectual property is valuable to them. When an IP lawyer says that, we're talking about the set of legal rights they have, and that is also valuable to some companies uh, to have and to be able to enforce these IP rights. So you have to be careful what's being referred to when people talk about intellectual property. So quite often the people struggling with this issue or trying to argue for patent or copyright or trademark usually will say something like um, – well, number one, they'll, they'll, refer to, uh, they'll refer to copying someone else's uh, design um, or their, their novel or their, or their words. They'll call that stealing or theft, okay? Um, but the problem is that it's not stealing or theft even under the current copyright statute. The copyright statute does not um, call or label an act of copying that's unauthorized as theft or stealing. And of course under libertarian law it's not theft or stealing at all because you're not taking anything – from someone that they own. You're just using information to to manipulate things that you own, which is not theft at all. Uh, at, at most, at worst, it's emulation or competition, which is not a crime or, or an act of uh, any kind of offense under libertarian principles. But even under copyright law, um, it's not theft. It's what's called infringement. So basically the copyright statute and the patent statute – uh, specify uh, an offense of uh, for infringement. That's the unauthorized use of some uh, some pattern of information, which carries certain liability with it. You know, the obligation to pay certain monetary penalties or damages, etc. But it's not theft, and even the Supreme Court has uh, has made this clear. So that's one thing we should quit calling it theft, because even under the current positive law, it's not theft. Um, one of the worst arguments for IP involves the this sort of challenge that um, um, uh, that equates copyright infringement to plagiarism. Now, plagiarism has almost nothing to do with copyright, and copyright has nothing to do with plagiarism. Copyright – so plagiarism means the presentation of – usually like the literally quoted work from someone else while presenting it as your own work, like changing the name of – like not giving proper credit to someone that you're quoting, pretending like you wrote the words. That's just an act of dishonesty or possibly contract breach or possibly fraud in some cases, usually not. Usually it's just a violation of like an academic code of conduct or academic um, uh, scholarly standards uh, and customs. <clears throat> and you can get embarrassed or get in trouble for it or expel from school or get a low grade on a test um, if you're caught plagiarizing. But it really has nothing to do with copyright, and, and the way to explain this is 
Um, well, number one, let's suppose I copy a DVD of a Hollywood movie or I copy the latest best-selling uh, novel, but I keep the name of the author or the producer on the film or on the DVD or on the book. So that's not plagiarism at all. I'm not pretending that I produced it. I'm just making a copy and giving it to someone else or selling it or using it on my own. I'm not committing plagiarism at all, and the law would still prohibit that. So copyright law is not concerned with honesty. It's concerned with stopping you from copying something, even if you're not dishonest about it, even if you don't plagiarize. Um, and another example would be to consider works that are in the public domain, like the Bible and uh, uh, Shakespeare's plays and uh, uh, lots of older works, um, older novels. There is nothing in copyright preventing people from copying these things now because they're in the public domain or from plagiarizing. You know, I could, uh, I could, uh, I could take Hamlet and republish Shakespeare's play and put my name on it as the author, and I could try to sell it on Amazon. It might violate some terms of con service with Amazon. I don't know. I doubt it. But the point is it has nothing to do with copyright. So plagiarism is uh, – and, and furthermore, we don't see that happening. We never see classic works from the old days being repackaged under someone's name and someone trying to pass it off under their name. So plagiarism – is only a very narrow problem in, in a certain context, and it's already dealt with by by academic and scholarly customs and uh, and by uh, institutional rules at, at at universities and schools and things like that. So it really has nothing to do with IP law or copyright. So the problem is the advocate of copyright will try to trap opponents of it by accusing us of being in favor of plagiarism. As if getting rid of copyright law means that we're in favor of plagiarism, uh, or as if copyright law is the mechanism designed to stop plagiarism, and as if that's basically all it does, and that's just frankly false. So that's a false argument. It's it's um, I don't know if it's dishonest in every case. I think it's either based on ignorance or it's dishonest in most cases. Um, uh, and the point is um, – you can easily tell this because if you talk to the advocate of copyright and say, well, if I'm willing to keep the name of the author on the novel, am I free to reproduce it and sell it then? And they'll say no. So you see their goal is not really to stop plagiarism. So that's really just a, a dishonest argument that they use. Um, <clears throat> so it's not about theft and it's not about plagiarism. It's also not about fraud. You'll hear this quite often um, in the copyright plagiarism context or especially in the trademark context. Um, and I've written a whole article on this um, in, re in response to Frank Van Dunn's criticism of me and Walter Block for being overly libertarianly legalistic or something. Um, the, um, the argument is that uh, if uh, trademark law is justified, this is usually the argument, uh, because – Fraud is a is something that we libertarians oppose. So they're presupposing that the main purpose of trademark law is to stop fraud, and therefore it's justified. Well, okay, so the problem with this is fraud is already um, an offense under the law. It's you know it's either contract breach or some kind of fraud. fraud. Um, so to the extent Fraud ought to be impermissible. It's already impermissible under the law, and to that extent, if trademark law really stopped it, then it's just redundant with already existing law. So if we got rid of it, we would still have fraud and contract law. Um, but the thing is trademark law is not aimed at stopping fraud, um, and either the, opponent, the proponents of trademark law either know this and they're being dishonest or disingenuous… Or they don't know it, in which case they really shouldn't be running their mouths and talking about trademark law. Because trademark law doesn't have a fraud standard in it. It has a, a standard that has to do with the likelihood of uh, confusing consumers. Okay, So it's not actual confusion of consumers. It's likelihood. Um, but under, under the way the law works, this permits the – so-called owners of trademarks to uh, 
seize goods that are counterfeit goods and to sue people who are selling counterfeit goods, um, even when the consumers that are buying those counterfeit goods are not defrauded. So, for example, you know, someone who buys a $20 fake Rolex watch or a $10 fake Chanel purse uh, almost in every case knows that they're buying a fake. And they want to buy a fake so they can save a lot of money. That's exactly why they're doing it. So the consumer is literally not defrauded, and the seller of the fake item is not defrauding anyone. So fraud is not at the basis of the right under the law of the trademark holder to stop that sale or to seize those goods. So trademark law has nothing to do with fraud. Um, and again, to the extent fraud should be prohibited, it, it can be taken care of by contract law and fraud law. You don't need trademark law. Trademark law should be totally abolished for the same reasons, by the way, that, um, that Rothbard explains in The Ethics of Liberty, I think in the chapter on knowledge, true and false, why defamation law okay, should be um, uh, abolished and is incompatible with a libertarian society and libertarian principles. Um, the idea of – defamation, by the way, is the general term that covers libel and slander. Libel is the written form of defamation, and slander is the, the oral form of defamation. Uh, and by the way, not the verbal form. The, people make this mistake all the time. I always correct people about this. Um, they'll use the term oral contract. I say, they'll say verbal contract. When what they mean is oral contract. Most contracts are verbal. That, that means they use words. A written contract is a verbal contract, and so is an oral contract. They're both verbal contracts. So when you want to distinguish between the two types of contracts, written or oral, say written or oral. And by the way, not all contracts are verbal. You could have uh, uh, implied contracts, or you can have contracts between people that just gesture. They might not even speak the same language. Um, you know, I hand you a dollar, you hand me a newspaper from your stand. Uh, there's really no – there's a sale, there's a contract, but there's no, there's no words being exchanged. So there's different types of contracts. And by the way, and before we get to the final sort of a fallacious argument, always trotted out in favor of uh, IP, which is the contractual argument, um, on the fraud issue – and this gets back to the uh, also to the, uh, the the plagiarism charge argument given for copyright. Um, fraud. You have to understand what fraud really is, and I've written about this in my contract theory article and other places. Fraud is not just deceiving someone or being dishonest. Uh, if it if it means something so broad, then it can't be a, a crime or an offense under libertarian principles or law. Because being dishonest per se is not a crime. Uh, you have the right to lie, and you have the right to be deceitful, and you have the right to be dishonest. There's only a certain context in which your deceitful actions give rise to an offense, which we call fraud. And the best way to think of that, in my view, is what the common law calls um, theft by trick. If you understand that, number one, all human rights, all rights, all individual rights are necessarily property rights, Okay, as Rothbard points out in The Ethics of Liberty. So all rights are property rights. That's what rights are. They are property rights. But what that means is all rights, all property rights, or the exclusive right to control a given scarce resource Okay, uh, from your own body to other resources out there in the world that we need to use as means of action that we could have conflict over with other people who might want to use those resources too. But because of their nature of scarce resources, they cannot be used by multiple people at the same time. That's why we have property rules. So all property rights, all human rights are property rights to control scarce resources. So that's what rights uh, are. And contract is simply a way that owners of resources can temporarily or permanently or partially or completely transfer control of those resources to someone else. In other words, the owner of a thing 
by virtue of being its owner, by having a property right in the in the resource, you have the right to permit someone else to use that resource or to deny them permission to use the resource, to exclude them from using it. That's what ownership really means. It really means the right to exclude other people from using the resource or to consent to them using it, whether that be your body or some other resource that you own. So a contract is just a more formal, uh, usually a more complete or final uh, grant of this consent. You know, if a girl consents to a boy kissing her, we don't really call that a contract, but that is the the exercise by her of her property rights in her body. She's consenting to it being used in a certain way. You know, if I invite people to my home for a meeting or a party, I'm granting them permission to enter and use my home for limited purposes for the duration of the of the specified event until I eject them or change my mind or whatever. Okay, and sometimes you want to make this permanent. So I want to sell you a half ownership interest in my home. That's a contract. Or I want to sell you my home for good. Or I want to sell you a life estate or an easement. Uh, I'm sorry, or a user fruct in my in my home. Um, or if I want to lease you my home for a month, that is, you can rent it from me, your tenant for a month or a year or whatever. These are different, more or less formal agreements by which I alienate some of my rights. I, I grant consent to someone to use the property in some kind of specified way. And in the simplest case, I just simply transfer complete ownership from me to you. So that's what a contract is. The contract is just the manifestation of ownership of a resource by the owner. Instead of just giving temporary permission for someone to borrow or use the thing, they're, grant, they're turning over title to it completely, uh, in most cases, to someone else. So that's what contracts are. Contracts are not uh, binding promises, as most people conceive of them. Contracts are simply the transfer of title to owned resources which is one of the things you can do as owner of a resource. You can grant permission for someone to use it, or you can alienate title to it to someone else. Now, this is Rothbard's uh, path-breaking, I believe, and revolutionary and underappreciated um, theory of contract, um, as developed by him and Williamson Evers, uh, uh, someone who collaborated with him on some of these ideas uh, decades ago. Now, the reason I go into that is the nature of property rights, what property rights are, and the nature of what rights are, uh, and the nature of what contract is, uh, helps to explain what fraud is in the sense that it could be an offense or a, um, a tort or some kind of contract breach under libertarian law. And now I, the reason I said it's sometimes characterized as theft by trick is that you know if two people are making an exchange – I give you a coin in exchange for your apple, then there's an understanding between the parties. It's usually implicit. Sometimes it can be explicit. It can be written or it could be oral. It doesn't matter. The point is there's an understanding, a meeting of the minds, the, the common law calls it, as to what's going on here. And that is I'm giving you title to my coin conditioned upon you giving me title to, quote, the apple, unquote. Now that has a meaning. The coin has a meaning. We understand it's a real coin. It's not a fake coin. We understand there's an apple. It's not a plastic apple. It's not an apple with worms in it. So we both are giving title to our things to the other conditioned upon the other person reciprocating with the title to their thing. And there's a host of other conditions there. You know, um, uh, The condition that the other party is not knowingly misrepresenting the status of the thing he's giving to me. So if someone gives me a, knowingly gives me a rotten apple in exchange for my coin, knowing that I'm expecting a good apple and knowing that I'm expecting the apple seller not to be deceiving me, okay, and the apple seller knows that he's getting my coin conditioned upon that, then if he knowingly gives me a bad apple and takes my coin, he's taking my coin without my, um, without my genuine consent. Okay, because my consent is in effect 
conditioned. I'm, I'm basically saying I'm giving you this coin, but only if and to the extent you're not deceiving me. Like that's one of the conditions I'm effectively placing on the transfer of uh, the title to the coin. And if the guy receives the coin knowing that the condition hasn't been fulfilled, even if I don't know it yet, that he's in possession in effect of my coin. The title hasn't transferred. So if he goes and spends it, he's basically committing an act of conversion or theft. That is what fraud is. Fraud is the, um, the use of trickery or deception to obtain someone's property – I shouldn't say property – someone's re owned resource uh, without their genuine consent. And there's an analog to this idea of genuine consent, by the way, in uh, – like in the field of medicine when you have uh, – um, uh, say surgeries being performed and you consented to that there's a question of whether there was informed consent depends upon what the surgeon told you and uh, all those kind of things but in any case um, that's a that's a, a digression my point is that's what fraud is and that's why we ought to have a, a type of contract or property uh, tort or something like that um, that uh, that recognizes that this type of fraud is a type of wrongdoing under libertarian law it's a type of uh, uh, trespass to property in a sense or, or theft of property in a sense. But that is not what happens in trademark law. That's not what trademark law stops. What trademark law stops, is, as I said, was um, it, it basically protects the reputation rights of the so-called owner of the trademark, which is why I analogize it to defamation law. So Rothbard explained the defamation law. Is not a legitimate uh, tort under libertarian principles, primarily because to have a, a right to a reputation is to have the right to other people's brains because your reputation is just what other people think of you. So if you have a right to your reputation, you would have to have a property right in other people's minds or brains, uh, which, of course, you don't have. So you can't have a right to a reputation, and really the arguments for trademark are similar to the rights – the arguments for reputation rights, which is what defamation law is aimed at stopping uh, – protecting. Um, um, the idea for trademark is that you know, a company builds up the goodwill in its customers and in its name and its reputation and its brand marks, and so therefore – has created the value in those marks and owns it. But as you can see, that's very similar to reputation. Anyway, the argument that trademark law stops fraud is just wrong because once you have a right to your reputation as embodied in a trademark, this permits you to sue people using a similar um, name or mark as you even when they're not defrauding anyone. Okay, So it's really not based upon fraud. So these are all false arguments given for um, – to argue in favor of patent, copyright, and trademark law. Um, the fraud argument, the plagiarism argument, and of course the theft analogy, which is not a good analogy, N nor is the piracy by the way. Um, piracy is when you know a, a ship of thieves boards another ship and shoots people and breaks things and takes things that people own. That's what piracy is. Uh, of course, that's not what happens in copyright infringement when people cop copy information that's publicly available and use it to guide their own behaviors and modify their own resources uh, in the privacy of their own factories or houses. Um, that's not piracy um, or theft. And the final argument that's always given is that um, uh, when you argue against patent or copyright, someone, someone will invariably say that um, – that uh, that patent or copyright are justified because people are free to make contracts with each other. So what they don't understand here, I think, or maybe they do and they're being disingenuous, is that copyright and patent law have literally nothing whatsoever to do with the practice of making contracts. Um, first of all, contracts – in the Rothbardian sense, they're only transfers of title to alienable information, alienable resources. But even if you regarded contracts conventionally as just binding promises, let's forget about that distinction. Uh, contracts only bind parties to a contract. A and B can have a contract that does not create property rights. Property rights are what's called in rem. That's rights in real things that are good against the world. 
I don't have to have a contract with the rest of the world to have a title to my farm that I homesteaded and and uh, constructed myself, right? I don't have a contract with people. I have a property right in that farm and in my home and in my body. I don't have to contract with someone to prevent them or to have a right against them murdering me or using my body without my permission. It's a it's a property right. And this is exactly what the patent and copyright systems attempt to set up for creative works and for inventions. They make them in rem rights or real rights because no contract is required. So when people say that – and contract rights are what's called in personam. That's just rights between the, the enumerated parties to the contract. So you could never get in rem rights from a contract because – they would the contract would not bind third parties that are not parties to the contract whereas property rights do and one way to, to 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 show this is to just ask the proponent of patent and copyright <clears throat> ask any typical proponent of patent and copyright whether they would be okay with modifying patent and copyright so that they didn't affect people that had not voluntarily agreed to be bound by uh, some kind of regime, some kind of contractual regime. And of course, every patent lawyer and copyright lawyer and advocate, uh, the Hollywood, you know, the movie industry, the music industry, Hollywood, um, the pharmaceutical industry, they would go in completely insane over the idea that, uh, that only people that are contractually bound uh, are affected by their copyright or patent rights. Because they know that that would totally eviscerate and gut the entire system because it would transform it from an in-realm property right, which the law protects right now, to a contract right, which would only affect people that had agreed to be bound by it. They would never accept that um, because they understand that co copyright and patent law set up real rights that are not based upon contract right, which means that you could not – you can't justify patent or copyright or anything like it based upon the notion of freedom of contract. Yes, in a free society, we ought to permit people to enter contracts as they see fit. But that would not and could not ever result in a patent or copyright type system, as I've explained in detail um, in my Against Intellectual Property. So – those four things really annoy me when I hear them repeated over and over and over and over again by people who usually don't even understand the basics of the different types of IP law, um, especially when all these things are just completely false and have been refuted many times. But I guarantee you they'll come up again and again and again. I'll hear all these again probably in the next month on Facebook or other places, but in the future maybe I could just refer people back to this uh, podcast. All right, signing out. See you guys next time.